Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here today. And I want to thank you even more because it's Saturday morning, not up at 9 o'clock. <laughs> not very usual. Thank you very much. I'm going to start talking to you about shame and the shadow. Um, I will start by a definition of Webster Dictionary, which defines shame as the painful emotion excited by consciousness of guilt, shortcoming, and improperty. In this paper, I wish to discuss how the emotional shame sets in during childhood and how it seems to arise out of the young child's recurrent experiences of his shortcomings, inadequacy, and dependency in his attempts to find out about himself, his mother, father, and the whole world around him. Shame is always linked to an individual experience which takes place in relation to a social context, be it in relation to the mother, the father, siblings, child and school friends, or adults, or in the case of adults, to society as a whole. For shame to be experienced, it seems necessary for a baby to have developed enough ego to be able to acknowledge himself and his mother and other people in his environment as separate and endowed with certain good or bad attributes. This usually occurs gradually, but is established towards the end of the first year of life, <coughs> reaching its peak in the various phases toilet training and during the ethical stage. In the latter, jealousy and rivalry of the parents of the same sex are at their highest and are accompanied by feelings of shame about one's own inadequacy. In the course of comparing how much more the rival parent and the desired one can offer each other, the child suffers great anguish and is rejected. He envies the couple, but also feels guilty and shame about it. Each individual child deals with these painful emotions by adopting defense mechanisms which help to mitigate the anguish, frustration, and the blow to its, his narcissism. Two tendencies are, however, commonly experienced to regress into baby <coughs> stage and turn backwards in order to avoid the conflict or to become prematurely independent. That is to say, they are both unsatisfactory as they tend to leave, <coughs> sorry, that is to say, a jump ahead of the conflict in order to overcome it. These ways are both unsatisfactory as they tend to lead to loss of ego and to pathological splitting rather than to integration, working through, and assimilation of the shadow aspect. My of the shadow is a necessary task for all beings. About this, Jung writes, quote, although with inside and goodwill, the shadow can, to some extent, be assimilated into the conscious personality, experience shows that there are certain features which offer the most obstinate resistance to moral control and prove almost Within the family, the bucket of the shadow is passed on from the older sibling to the young ones, often with merciless cruelty, as the young one represents outwardly the messy stage the older ones have just managed to triumph over. The same occurs when parents and adults in general project their inadequacy, that their conscious feelings of shame and guilt onto the children contributing to the child's feeling that he is inadequate because he is small. Since this is a fact, the child has to live there. He suffers from severe blows to his narcissism, feels ashamed of his moments, and tries to compensate for his inadequacy by over-identifying with grown-ups. <coughs> Indeed, there is much praise for good children who never cry, who will behave, and who act like little adults, both at home and in the social context. In this case, 
models is equated with an inadequacy and mess, and dignity, with competence and perfection and acceptability. As the child moves out of the family into the wider world, he or she will be shamed in school by teachers and other older students who evoke shame as an effective way to control his or her behavior. This varies, of course, from culture to culture, but tends to be widely employed as a means of controlling behavior. However, the shaming and denigrating of weakness and overpraising of strength and power are even more extreme in collective structures, such as social institutions, political, religious, military, and professional organizations, and tend to be experienced by the child via the collective unconscious. In the same way in which a very young baby can dispose of all his bad, frustrating feelings into the mother breast, who then becomes equated with balance, a group can become intolerant of its shameful and messy side, split it off, and project it on to a weaker group nearby. He may then attack the group carrier of its own shameful projection with the aim doing away with some shadow outside there. Collective conflicts are caused by shadow projections, leading in extreme cases to wars. In such cases, the shadow archetype is activated but dissolved because of the sense of shame and guilt that it engenders. <coughs> Having thus constructed the theoretical framework for the clinical part of my paper, I would now like to explore with the support of the collective of the, of the clinical material the links between the collective and personal shadow, the emotion of shame and its reflection on the life of the individual, first in the early infancy and then in relation to the case of a five-year-old boy called Griffin. My starting point will be your statement, nothing is more disillusioned and the discovery of one's own inadequacy. Shame in infancy. Given the fact that at the beginning of life, the tendency of the mother is total, frustration is unavoidable. For even at the best of times, there is often a gap between the child's subjective feeling of his need and the mother's more or less empathic understanding and satisfying of her. This state of affair tends to lead the infant to experience from the start the negative side of the tendency, although totally unconscious of his situation. When frustrated, he is filled with feelings of impotence, helplessness, rage, and despair, which differ in each individual baby according to his own natural resources. At this point, omnipotent fantasies come about to help the baby's survival. In them, the frustrating object turn bad is pushed away and disposed of, while a good, fulfilling fantasy is hallucinated and retained in time of duress in order to make life terrible. However, in the process of growing up and with the increase of the young child's sense of reality, that is to say, in a psychologically healthy situation, omnipotent fantasy, fantasies received and the baby is bound to face come to terms with the fact he and his mother are two persons and that she is the most autonomous of the two. A situation of trust has to be established as feelings of being separate increase in the baby and awareness of his needs and dependency, as well as an anxiety whenever he feels involved in the environment. For example, when he fails to make things happen the way he wishes. Because a child is not aware, and I think this is important, that he will outgrow each of the de developmental stages, his shortcomings related to each of them tend to arouse a great deal of anxiety, shame, and guilt, and envy of the bigger and more powerful people, as well as the wish to be an adult. <coughs> when all goes well, with the help of parental care, tolerance and support, the baby comes to accept such a painful state of affairs. 
usually between first and third year of life. The child has mastered their skills and is struggling to manage his impotent and omnipotence. His sensitivity to feelings of shame is appeared at this stage in the highest. Parents have to provide containment and support for the child to be able to manage and integrate impotence and omnipotence, hopelessness and helplessness, because while struggling with physical growth and development in the outer world, the child's ego is also to cope in the inner world with a primitive superego operating in accordance with the higher role, shaming the ego in order to keep violent, instinctual drives under control. Thus, when the parents, instead of relating to their child at each stage of his development, have unrealistic expectations of the human heart, or overwhelm the baby with massive archetypal unconscious projections of their own, being unable to relate to or feel threatened by the instinctuality of the baby inside themselves, the child has to rely mainly on his own capacity to protect and contain himself, with the result that his defenses encroach on the potential space for relationship. Growing up means having to come to terms with and manage powerful instinctual drives and uncontrollable, uncontrollable urges, all kinds of extreme and opposite emotions. And because in the early stages of infant's life, the boundaries between internal and external are not clearly differentiated, maternal care is extremely important in helping to mitigate the archetypal quality of the baby's experiences and allowing for flexibility in the defensive system. Thus, defenses will be built by the baby as protection in time of distress and need, which can be dropped when the baby the bad feelings go away, rather than rigid barriers which will prevent interaction between opposites. To give an example, using splitting mechanism behavior of the child can dissolve his vulnerable and shameful bits make him feel bad inside and out, therefore, had to be bad, and pushed away outside himself by projecting mechanism while retaining the bits which make him feel good. When splitting is excessive, the shadows rise at the expense of ego consciousness. Development becomes one-sided, and independence, toughness, pseudo-competence are prematurely advocated by the child who's aiming successful adaptation and severe costs to his psychic health. I should now like to give an example of how the realization of being separate from others, which comes about at the time of weaning and when the child is beginning to walk, highlights feeling of both impotence and omnipotence at the same time. Weaning seems to stir up in the child feelings of shame, inasmuch as the child attributes the loss of the breast to his own inadequacy in bed. The baby seems to feel, there must be something wrong with me if mother pushes me away. Now, Lily was a normal and generally well adapted baby with a caring good enough mother who at the age of 14 months was having difficult time after winning from the breast. And it will be apparent that in order not to feel rejected and failure for having lost the breast, she was compensating by trying to behave in a way that was grown up beyond rage. The passage I'm going to quote are extracts from observational reports recorded by a student of Infant Observation Seminar in the Society of Analytical Psychology. This person went to visit the mother and baby all once weekly for two years. One observation, one observation reports, quote, Lily seemed to be terribly intent on getting the right things she wanted and I feel desperately upset if she or her mother did not get it right. Quite minor things, such as when she wanted tea rather than fruit juice, or when she asked for something and her, her mother could not guess what she wanted quickly enough. Her frustration was very obviously clear. Now, this was at the age uh, of around 14 months. A couple of weeks later, in the course of another observation, 
really is trying to prove that she is a big girl. This time she does so by trying to steal her older sister's possessions. The observer lies. Lily goes to correct the book from the table and brings it to mother. Then she sits on her lap and turns, turns the pages. It's a grown-up book and wants me to have a look at it. Then she, then she wants a book which belongs to her sister. Mother allows her to look at it, but she soon loses interest and points to a box which belongs to her sister. Mother tells her that the game inside is too difficult for her, but Lily insists on trying, and Mother lets her play with it and find out by herself that it's difficult. <coughs> she soon gets frustrated with it and eventually gets on with her own toy at Boston Band. She opens the door of the van and takes all the shapes out of it and wants to put them back in again to a hole that is at the top. Mother helps her with the first two, and then Lily is able to carry on by herself. She is thrilled with excitement and pleasure. She claps her hand and wants Mother and the observer to do the same each time she succeeds. She does it over and over again. They praise her and she claps her hands. It is important that both parents and sisters spend most of their time to know that both parents and sisters spend most of their time reading. So reading must appear to reading to be an enviable activity. She has to come to terms with the fact that she cannot yet read. And mother lets her find out about it herself, which is helpful. At 22 months, the following was observed. Lily points to a wall where a lot of her sister's endless paintings are hanging. Mother shows me one done by Lily in 20 months and comments that it is very impressive. While she's talking about her children's artistic gifts, Lily climbs on a chair and begins to make unspecified noises. Mother asks if she wants to do a pool. Lily nods. Mother gets the pocket and removes her napkin while she's standing in the middle of the room. Lily then goes to the coffee room, looking very solemn. It is a serious business. Mother, uh, she performs and immediately after gets up with a little smile. Mother wipes her as soon as she's left her free. She begins to run around the room and marches up and down, half naked. She then runs in and out of the kitchen with a satisfied smile smile on her face. From this description, it can be seen how the painting and the performing of the poppy are linked up in Lily's mind. They are both tremendous personal achievements of which she is proud and make her feel good about herself. Lily's mother is a very tolerant mother who supports her child's struggle and patiently encourages her to gain confidence and to bear frustration.
with a seven-year-old son. Ricky's symptoms worsened from the time his stepmother appeared on the scene. Recently, anxiety about him, both at home and at school, had escalated to such a degree that the family and the child psychiatrist came to feel that if all else failed, hospitalization for Ricky might be necessary. When I met Ricky for the first interview, he appeared to me very lively, warm and responsive, but looked persecuted, tense, muddled and confused. He entered my room accompanied by his stepmother and his social worker. He was a very tiny fellow with a large head set on a disproportionately thin and small body. His face was pale and wrinkled like that of an old man. This older man appearance was reinforced by his holding himself upright and pacing stiffly and down the room, carrying a book under his little arm, like a big man with his day in his window. Despite his big act, he looked very frightened, tense and uneasy, crouched on the floor by his stepmother in search of protection, well away from me and turning his back on me. At one point, while his stepmother commented on an improvement in school, he turned around, looked into my eyes, giving me a real good look. He seemed reassured and accepted the paper and pens if I was then offering him, moved closer to me to display his grinding abilities. Then, as soon as his stepmother moved on to talk about the problems with him at home, he broke the house. At first, it was a small house where he, the father, and the two brothers lived. He portrayed his little brother just like himself, with a very large head and big ears, and scornfully called him the big headed and big ears. Uh, there was no mother in the house. The two brothers were at the window, while he drew himself and his father holding hands through the front door. The house looked as if crammed with bodies. So I commented that it would be small for all those people. He went to a bigger house next to it, where the people had more space, but again with no female figure in it. His stepmother, who had been watching him drawing, his drawing commented on the absence of the mother, taking it as an attack against her step, added, he is exclusively attached to his daddy and pushes me away. I suggested that therapy be able to help him with that problem and went on to make arrangements for treatment. By now, Ricky had settled in the room and was exploring the toys. He had moved away from me and was playing in the doll's house, arranging the furniture in the various rooms, very concentrated and quiet. At the end of his session, his omnipotence manifested himself. He collected the drawings he had made and told me he was going to take them home to show his dad. I suggested to leave them here, but he baffled me by marching out of the room with his drawings under his arm, looking like an executive with his work projects. I realized he was going to provoke, he was provoking me to a battle. At that, yes, at that stage, I could not interpret him either. I decided to let him take his way. He had reached the way out, and I had re-entered my room when suddenly he ran back into the room, kissed me goodbye, and rushed out of the door again. Note that his approach to me occurred after his stepmother spoke, spoke of his writing. When she mentioned his problem, shortcomings, and inadequacy, he drew the house excluding her and displaying his wish that the father get got rid of her. <laughs> At the end of the session, he did the same with me. He was not taking any notice saying, only concerned with his father and wanting to please him. So from the very beginning, he put me in a situation of being the one that to be excluded, like he felt excluded himself. Uh, the following session, he sounded very confused about me. And this puzzled him a great deal and made him very anxious. It seemed to, to be, uh, it seemed to me that uh, 
to be a projection of his own anxious and confused feelings about his own identity in everybody else's. I commented about it to him, and a flood of muddled up, confused questions to himself burst out of his mouth, leaving no time for any answer on my part. How many mothers did he have? Uh, he asked himself. He then answered he had an old mom and a new mom. He seemed to ask me which was his real mom. How many brothers did he have? And that again seemed to confuse him. Then he said he, that his old mom had a brother living with her. Was he his new dad? Who were all these people? Who was he? Who was I? All these questions seemed to find out in Ricky's mind as he could not get any answer. He was helplessly mixed up and insecure. I began to feel the confusion and mental mess. <coughs> Mudding everyone and everything up was a defensive maneuver against helplessness and unbearable anxiety about not knowing, about being a dependent baby. It was at this stage that his language also became muddled up and incomprehensible. However, he would swiftly come out of his confusion, shifting to a precarious identification with the big man power, as he looked more like a man going to work, or he was reading and writing as a man in many ways of provoking me and himself and showing me his abilities. In an attempt to deny and ward off the chaotic feelings of the baby inside himself. Thus, I found myself during the whole of his treatment having to work with a pair of opposite big and small, where big, I later discovered, meant to him a state of idealized order, power, knowledge, and invulnerability, whereas small was equated with mass, happiness, and vulnerability. This, of course, is quite a usual feature of the way people shift and think, due both to the experience of reality and to the interplay of archetypal projection, their own, and that of the parents, which gets quickly constellated in the transfers. However, in Ricky's case, the polarization, the biggest one, had reached a very high degree of autonomy. That was true all other pairs of opposites and blocked the natural development, <coughs> developmental process of deintegration, reintegration. Now I use the term deintegration, reintegration according to Michael Gordon's theoretical concept of the final set, which is the primary integrate which at birth begins to unfold according to rhythms inherent. Now, uh, if Ricky could not allow a full reintegration, deintegration to take place for fear of remaining a helpful, helpless, messy baby forever, the consequence was his defensive shift from baby to old man, both in the treatment and outside in the world. In fact, his parents too had great fears of showing their vulnerability and helplessness and projected an image of self-denial, strength, and ability in order to cope even with the impossible, thus identifying with the wives of men and women, while both the mother who had left and Ricky had to carry their projection of incompetence, weakness, and uselessness. At the same time, Ricky's behavior shamed them as it was intolerable for them and prompted them to do anything possible for help. To help. Now, to return to the early phase of the treatment, I felt that there was a great deal of this big boy act that had to be allowed by me to transfer. And I restrained my interpretation about the other side. The messy baby in order not to shame him and ask who is persecutory guilt. I made occasional comments about his wish to show me how good and competent he was at doing his homework, in order not to make him feel attacked and 
interested by interpretation able to draw out if they decide. I felt I should wait for Idina Baby to be introduced by him when he was ready for it. Thus allowing him in the session to feel in charge and letting myself to be the helpless baby. And indeed, many sessions were spent by him reading one school book after the other and making me feel totally useless, controlled, and shut off, like the baby inside himself, to which, as yet, we did not have access. When I felt that this stage had lasted long enough, I asked him one day, the only pose in his reading, in which he had appeared particularly threatened by the silence, what was he afraid of that would happen to him if he stopped reading? Did he think he'd come to the clinic like to school? Why was he coming to see me? For a while, he did not answer. But soon after, dropping his book, he began in a very hyperactive manner to go around the room, touching everything, opening drawers, dashing about at such a speed that paralyzed me. Meanwhile, he was flooding me with all sorts of questions. This shoe, too, shot out of his mouth at such a speed that it was obvious to me that they did not want to answer. Julie here, just did in that bed, then touching something on my desk. Can I take it home? What is it? Can I have it? His behavior was escalating into a frenzy of activities, questions, and excitement that suddenly filled up the whole room. I felt their aim was to render me impotent. And there was no room or gap for me to say anything at all, except to take up and, and exert the controlling stance, like a super ego authority, which I did not want to be. I thought now, I thought, now that the big man mask has been dropped, I was beginning to see the chaotic baby and his terrifying confusion, resulting in fact, from his persecutory, persecutory shame and guilt. The interesting feature of the ship, I think, was its automatic sway from one position to its opposite, without any in-between stage or transition time. It took me by surprise, and I began to understand what the difficulty must have been like at home. It also gave me an idea of how much he had said things happened to him, and suddenly changed, finding him totally different and unprepared, as I found myself in the counter trousers. This led me to speculate about his weaning and how his mother's departure must have occurred very suddenly, without any explanation being given to him, and without giving him any time to adjust to it at all. The session which followed was one in which the big mess took place. He rushed into the therapy room, again carrying the book in his hand, and without a word, checked that everything was in order. Then began to read. I say he was starting to read again to avoid getting out of control as it happened on the previous occasion, as I might tell him off. His face today looked much more relaxed than in the previous interviews. He dropped the book and moved to the table where pencil, paints, and paper were displayed and said, I want to do a proper painting today. He sat down at the little table in front of a large sheet of paper. And as I was pouring out some water from the tap into a pot from a toilet brush, he started painting a large square with large, with very large strokes of dark blackish paint. While mixing the paint with the brush in the pot, he became excited. I'm drawing a house in this way. It's black and white. He was, as I was struck by the contrast of the black and white line, he said, no, 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 it's not. It is gray, smearing the colors one to the other and adding more colors 
by naming them. While asking his question, he had began to uh, show his manic hyperactive behavior of the previous day by pouring out all the pain from each individual post thoughts onto the paper. He looked at me defiantly and said, I need more water and more paint. And this continued until a thick, slimy mess that covered the paper and was beginning to flow from the paper onto the table and down to the floor. He was looking increasingly anxious. He went to the tap and did it himself with filling out the pots and pouring out the water from one into the other, mixing it all the paint left over. Then, taking the brushes and sprinkling water all over the place, he said, half the family and half fearfully. There had been a week. He then filled up the pots and poured water directly on to the painting until the water became a color on the floor. Then very anxiously, the man to the top table, trying with both arms open, spread around the little table to prevent the water from overflowing in a very peremptory way, he ordered me to stop the tap. You are asking me to help you to stop the uncontrollable mess you feel is pouring from inside you, which is making you feel very anxious and frightened as well. This interpretation shifted his behavior defensively. Here it was, a big man again. Very confidently, he asked me for a quite big job. Then the thing said the painting was too soggy. Then he wiped his hands clean, rushed where the clothes were, placed and began to play with some little car, taking a saloon family car, attaching a small trailer to it. All the time, however, he had been very curious about the contents of the big covers was in the room where what I usually kept other children's posing boxes, uh, giving it inquisitive glances. Then suddenly, reached the cupboard in which the toy boxes were kept, opened it wide, climbed into it, and tried to get hold of one of the toy boxes. I said he wanted to have everything inside the room and inside me cup the cupboard and myself. Realizing that he could not have it his own way, he said, reaching for the door handle, I am going to my daddy and waited to see for my reaction. I said, you want to go back to your dog, good daddy, because I have now become a bad person by not letting you have what you want. He smacked my hand, stepped back from the door he had opened. I closed it, and as I was saying it, he had my hand because it was very angry with me. He sat very stiff on his chair and started reading his good book again, aloud to himself. The story was about Janet and John helping mother to make cakes. He changed the word of the story and read out loud. You make horrible cakes. You feel I'm a horrible mummy, I said. And you want to go back to your good daddy because I deserve to be left by you for being so horrible. He took some small pieces of paper from his desk, wrote on them, and hid them under the telephone on my desk ordering me. I want to find them still here when I come next time. But I will not write my telephone number on them because you are horrible and you should not ring me up. Having said that, he made this more drawing on another piece of paper which he said was a nice present for me and then offered to fix up my drawer which he said was broken. I commented that he had attacked and smacked me when he felt that was being horrible to him. But now, he also wanted to please me and repair the damage that he felt he'd done to me. Because he felt it made me into a broken up mummy. This reference to a broken up mummy unleashed his persecutory guilt and anger. And once again, he attacked me and turned the room upside down in a sort of manic fancy running about with a lot of disorganized, scattered, broken up talk and activity.
activity in the rhythm of the classic Victorian gravity of the sort stirred up by the archetypal tendencies of the bad mother rest, resulting from its aggressive, impulsive, impulsive and destructive wishes against me as the frustrating mother we experienced in the transcripts. <coughs> To return to the first interview, the father and the stepmother, heavily projected all the badness onto the mother who left, confusing their own personal infantile unresolved problems with the reality of Ricky's situation. There was a lot of hatred and resentment on the part of the father towards his ex-wife that he also directed to Ricky. In fact, I found out from the boy that he thought he was bad, and that he was that it was his bad messiness which had made his good inner and outer mother abandon him, because in his view she left in order to punish him. It was his misery and guilt that induced his bad regressive behavior, as he could not forgive himself and did not want anybody else to forgive him either. His super ego was quite restless. <coughs> It was only through the work we did together and in becoming aware of the infantile fantasies as something distinct, no matter how much similar to real events that they appear to be, that he was able to feel good again. <laughs> For this to take place, the influence of the destructive collective shadow projection within the family had to be put into right perspective. Thus both his own archetypal fantasies and those of his parents had to be sorted out so that the relationship between the relationship with the mother, both in family and as family, and his love for her could once again come to the fore and be reestablished. Only this would make preparation possible and allow forgiveness of her and himself to take place. But for this to happen, he needed the analytic space and made in it, making a space inside myself to let him be and feel each time as he really felt, protected from collective archetypal shadow projections. It was my awareness of his need for such space, which clinical defines as the state of being alone in presence of mother and my analytic sensitivity that made me hold back from making in the beginning some obvious talking interpretations, waiting until I felt in touch and in tune with what he was bringing me in his sessions. In this way, I avoided humiliating him with my knowledge and reduced his consequence, consequence shameful feelings because I did not compete for knowing better. During sessions, he became increasingly persecuted by comments pointing to the desire. If I admitted to stress first, is an incompetent one. Any hint about his messy side shamed him and tended to make him become, become rather than feel totally helpless, incompetent and incontinent, which immediately produced a defensive, all annoying, all omnipotent false reaction. When he experienced excessive persecution and guilt in the session, his ego tended to splinter. At this point, he would generally become very excited and physically hyperactive. In such moments, interpretative work, work became totally impossible, and I experienced him as a very disturbed and difficult patient. On the other hand, when he exhibited his grown up, other bad behavior, his own control of the baby within was so strict that if again I felt he was unreachable. Of course, the difficulty in this particular case was also because he could not come for intensive analysis, so that I had to be very aware and sensitive to his level of tolerance of frustration and distress during session and between them, in order that the treatment would not break down. Thus, I had to devise a method of responding and almost anticipating his sudden shifts between the opposites in order to keep him in the center in the ego area 
where the therapeutic alliance will take place. And frame interpretation in such a way as always to bring together the good and the bad side. In this case, the big and the small. In order to avoid eliciting many flights and unbearable persecution in him, both the part of the, of the archetypal images of the super idealized men in Senate or the divided Messi-Baby poor had to come together in the presentation. In mentioning Senex and poor and referring to cultural pattern of his environment where only adults are valued and little children devalued. I also had to avoid restraining his behavior by active intervention, as he would restraining his behavior, yeah, avoid, sorry. I had to avoid restraining his behavior by active intervention on my part, as he would experience it as a controlling hand. I would become the control of them. He would then defy me to exert more control with the aim of repeating in the sessions the battle of the training that he was fighting with his husband mother at home. And the battles that he had fought over going to sleep with his daddy, where both hands either be defeated or they had to resort to physical violence in order to make him comply. He had a great passion for painting, which, as it later emerged, he had inherited from his real mother, who had become an art uh, student. He used pots of paint, both to express himself and to make diabolical messes, which he always cleared up in a very agitated and compulsive way. The messes always began, began as in the first by colors being mixed together and water added to them, which made the mixture unmanageable. The mixing of the colors and the brushes in the paint pot and the pots contained final scenes fantasy that had to be analyzed throughout this therapy. <coughs> what emerged in his treatment was his need to develop the containing boundaries around the baby and his hands, in which he would feel safe to express himself, that is to say, to assimilate his baby shadow. He worked hard at it himself, wanted to death, and again and again in faith and building frames. He was a very determined, intelligent, and humorous child, and I felt at later stages that his sense of humor helped me to put his behavior into perspective to him, which meant he could then have a good joke about himself and his son we could gang up. And the way they could gang up and drive daddy and mommy mad of joke and pull my leg in the sessions and enjoy being a funny clown and having fun about himself, making a mess, and being unable to do something or talk which was no longer threatening to him. He could allow himself to be muddled, foolish, not knowing a little, he not worry too much about it, as he came, came to accept both his sons. He could feel more often like a baby loved and appreciated by mother, both his other dad and a kind of messy, unwanted baby who had to delude himself to be grown up in order to feel loved. In brief, his shame may decrease because he'd been able to start integrating his own shadow. Thank you.